Lawrence Kotlikoff, thank you very much for joining us today. We're going to discuss your uh, book, Get What's Yours, which is now a bestseller. You know, uh, once upon a time on Social Security, we all thought if you took it at 62, you get less than you would at 66 or 70. So the longer you waited, the more you got, and that's that. Yeah. And uh, your wife would get something. If you're disabled, you might get something, but uh, pretty simple. We all know the federal income tax code is a horror. I can tell you the federal election laws are a horror, but whoever would have thought something seemingly as simple as Social Security would be so, gosh darn, complex. Yeah, it's hence the need for this book. <laughs> well, Steve, thanks for having me. Uh, and the system is incredibly complicated. There's 2,728 rules in their handbook, and there's literally hundreds of thousands of rules about those 2,728 rules in what's called their program operating manual system. And all of these rules and rules about the rules are written in uh, geek. They're written in, not, that's not Greek, it's geek, a language that nobody can understand. So people are flying blind when it comes to collecting Social Security. There's more than one benefit to be, be collected. There's not just your retirement benefit. There's actually 12 different benefits that you can collect. Parent benefits, child uh, uh, benefits, uh, spousal benefits, as you mentioned, widow benefits, divorcee benefits for spouses and for widows, uh, and uh, it goes on. You say that, uh, just as one little example, Americans leave $10 billion in unclaimed spousal benefits on the table each year. Yeah, this is really... Uh, $10 billion. That's a lot of money. A lot of... <coughs> this is just the beginning. <laughs> it's the beginning. And, and people that uh, don't know what they're doing could inadvertently lose their spousal benefit because Social Security has this rule that this gotcha that if you try and take two benefits at once one will you'll get the larger of the two so one will wipe out the other so the key to collecting a spousal benefit is to collect it by itself and let your retirement benefit grow this is actually how the book got uh, initiated my tennis partner Paul Salman who's the PBS NewsHour economics correspondent uh, we we're taking a break from tennis because he was beating me I needed to rest and he tells, and I started asking him when he's going to take Social Security, and he says, don't bother me, I've got it all figured out. I kept pushing him on this, and uh, within a couple of minutes, I had made him $50,000 and forced him to buy me dinner, just in free spousal benefits. And the trick in his case was his wife had to uh, uh, permit him to get a spousal benefit by filing for her own retirement benefit, suspending its collection, so she could wait till 70 to get her retirement benefit, and then he went and collected just his spousal benefit and, wait, and, and waited till 70 to collect his retirement benefit. Already getting complicated. So it's fair to say that we have a system today that randomly redistributes uh, between those who know the rules and those who don't. Yeah, we're very concerned in this country about in, inequality, and this is really outrageous, the fact that our basic saving system is so user-unfriendly that some people do, you know, they pay the same taxes potentially, get very different outcomes because they don't understand the rules. So that's really one of the big motivators for writing the book, Motivations. So how did it become so complex, something seemingly basic? We all think of Franklin Roosevelt and Ida Fuller and just you put the money in and collect it. How did it become so IRS-like? <laughs> <laughs> well, we tend in our country not to start from scratch to uh, fix things or redesign things. We just start to add on things. So over the years, they added spouse benefits and uh, survivor benefits and disability benefits. Uh, and the bureaucrats uh, just had a field day. They just went crazy and uh, decided that they were the social gods. They would decide who would uh, get what if they did it exactly this way, and if they didn't get it exactly that way, right, they would not get whatever it was that could be gotten. So this is really a bureaucrat's paradise, this system, and it's a national disgrace. So not, not that I'm opposed to Social Security. I want to point out, I think yeah. that we should be forcing people to save and forcing them to have disability and life insurance and, and longevity insurance, but the way this is structured is just really uh, Unbelievable. Does Congress have any real idea of what the system really is? No, I've been encouraging people <coughs> to uh, buy a copy of the book for their members of Congress and also call up their congressmen and ask them what they should do in terms of their benefit collection, just to drive the members of Congress c crazy to the point where they actually realize what it is that they've created. They've created a monster here 
over the years, and they need to fix it. We can't uh, sentence uh, every generation to come along to deal with a system that's this, is, that's this complicated and awful. You make the point, going to Social Security Administration, good people though they may be, that's the last place you want to go to get sound advice. Yeah, I would say about 40% of the time, the people at Social Security are, uh, uh, are giving you the wrong answer, either 100% wrong or partially wrong, or they're not really thinking through carefully your situation, they don't ask about. I'll give you an example. I've got a, a gentleman I met uh, at, a, at a dinner party recently. He's uh, a doctor in Boston. He, he's 68. He was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. So he hadn't taken Social Security. And he told me uh, that he went to Social Security and they said, well, you need to take your benefit right away because, gee, you're about to die and you'll at least get something. And that's what he did and they even gave him benefits retroactively for six months. He thought that was the right thing to do. Uh, then I started asking him about his wife. Turns out his wife is 65 and she didn't have much of an earnings history. So what they told him to do was the wrong thing because they didn't ask him about his wife or her earnings history. And uh, the best thing for him to do was wait till 70 and see if he made it that long because if he makes it till 70, her widow's benefit will be 16% higher for the higher rest of her life. She could make it to 100. Every month she'll have a 16% higher check to open because, she, because he did the right thing, which was different from what they advised. So he's actually uh, able to undo what they did because he can pay, he can, has a year to withdraw his decision and then start from scratch and that's what he's doing. Uh, just one example, each week you, uh, for PBS and uh, for Forbes, you have take a question like the old uh, Dear Abby and right. uh, uh, give give an answer, and uh, this uh, one individual asks, uh, "Will be 66, October 3rd. Quit my full-time job, December 31st." And then, and I'm not going to read the whole question, but in just the answer tells you all you need to know. This is what you say. In my answer, I'm going to assume you can't collect spousal, widows, divorcee spousal, or divorcee widows benefits. In other words, I'm going to assume you were never married, or were married for less than 10 years before getting divorced. Under these assumptions, your best course is to wait until then you go and give the answer. It's head scrambles the brain. <laughs> yeah, and you know, the, the, the curious thing is this, it's really a Sudoku puzzle, this, this system. And a lot of people are reading this column even if after they figure out what to do the, for themselves because they find it interesting to solve the puzzle. They want to learn the rules so that they can figure out for the next person whether what they read about can they guess the answer before I give it? Give the answer, and <laughs> that's that's the funny thing. But it's not really a, a joke or a puzzle. It's really uh, sad that uh, you, everything, every answer with Social Security begins and ends with a but. You know, do this, but if you're in this situation, it's different. If you're, in, you know. So uh, uh, you point out that. We all think that the, the, the risk for Social Security is your friend with the pancreatic cancer is, I better take it now because I might not be around to get in. I've spent a whole lifetime putting money in. Not, nothing's going right. to be there. You make the point, though, that uh, for all the travails of old age, the real risk is the risk of living. Yeah, because you know, we, we're all fixated on death and, and uh, illness surrounding death. That's our focus. So, and, and Social Security for years was telling people they should take their money right away so that they can get something before they die. Uh, and we're all sure that we're going to die on time. But uh, as you just indicated, uh, and there's, no there's just no guarantee you're going to die on time. The, uh, the real fact of the life is that the real risk from, from life is not dying because you get to go to heaven if you die. The real risk is living to 100 and not having the means to sustain yourself. Sustain yourself. So, if you're this very simple case of somebody who's 62 and they have the option of waiting till 70, uh, they can take a 76% higher benefit adjusted for inflation if they wait till 70, and that will continue right up to 100 or whatever, 110 if they live that long. And that's really insurance, longevity insurance. It's, it's dealing with the worst case scenario, which in this case is living. It's not dying it's and the living to 100. Annuity. Yeah, it's an annuity. It's exactly that longevity insurance. And that has tremendous value to people if they understand what's involved here. So we push that 
point very strongly in the book, right in the, I think the second chapter actually. So uh, you have uh, three general rules. The, the three general rules are be patient because there is this huge payoff built into the system from waiting. It's not true for everybody that everybody should be patient because uh, in some cases you want to take your benefit early in order to trigger benefits, uh, enable benefits for your kids or, or spouse or both. Uh, uh, but in general, patience is going to pay off. Uh, then you want to be aware of all the benefits. Sounds or about like marriage. Better yeah. be patient. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, and then you want to be aware of all the benefits. And then the third thing is you need to strategize. You need to time your benefit collection so that one doesn't wipe out the other because again you can't get two at once, two benefits at once. They'll give you just the higher of the two, the larger of the two. So the general idea is to take one benefit early and let the other one grow and then take that. So uh, let's uh, just for people to begin to understand this thing, this new world, uh, file and suspend, maybe unsuspend. What, what, walk us through that. Okay, uh, we, we call this uh, start, stop, start. Start your benefit, stop it and start it up again. So I'll give you an example of a, a real case, uh, a 62-year-old uh, gentleman who's married to a 45-year-old wife whose uh, child is uh, disabled and be was disabled before age 22. So if he starts his benefit early, he can therefore get uh, a child benefit going for his child <coughs> and also a what's called a child and care spouse benefit for his wife. She was working but now she stopped working. She's going to watch, the, uh, watch over the child. And he has the option at full retirement age, 66 in his case, to suspend his benefit and start it up again at 70. And it's not just special for him. Anybody who started their benefit early can suspend it once they reach full retirement age or any time after full retirement age up to 70 and then start it up at 70 again at a higher level. It's 8% per year for every year that you, that you suspend. So 62, you can... Suspend it at 66, and then at 70, so you, you start it at 32% so so higher. So if you start at 62, yeah. you take benefits and then suspend the benefit? How? You suspend the benefit. You go into the Social Security and you say, I'd like to suspend my benefit. And if you talk to the right person, they will understand that that's an option. Uh, and if not, you go talk to a different person. But uh, you're, after you read the book, you see this is actually what you can do. And then at 70, you start it up again at a 32% higher number. So every year from, se from uh, 70 to maybe 100, you're opening a 32% higher check. Anyway, you've, you've sacrificed your own benefits, because this gentleman has, because uh, they're going to start this lower level of retirement benefit, because he took his benefit early, at a 32% higher level. That's going to be a benefit starting from 70 that's lower than ha had he never taken anything and waited just till 70. But he's taken a hit on his benefits, but he's produced higher benefits for his wife and his child. And in that case, it turns out that there's about 10 different benefits that this household has to collect through time. Because the child first collects on the dad, then when the, when the mom takes her retirement benefits, since she had a higher earnings history, he collects on her. Then the dad dies, he collects on a child survivor benefit on the dad, because that's larger than the child benefit. And then he collects on the mom. So, and then, <laughs> yeah, it goes, yeah, that's the case, yeah. Um, so uh, when, when these rules are changed, do they have public hearings or is it where, where how, how do these, how are these things conjured up? Well, I'll tell you a, kind of a sad story here. We wrote in the book that disabled people could get free spousal benefits by withdrawing their immediate conversion of their disability benefit at full retirement age into a retirement benefit, that they could withdraw that conversion and then just file for a spouse benefit by itself and then take their retirement benefit at its highest val value at 70. And th so that they would have the same potential as, as married people or divorced people to get a full spousal benefit. And that's in the book. And then on December 23rd, right before Christmas, Social Security, some bureaucrat in Social Security changed the provision in this huge program operating manual system rules that uh, denied the disabled this right. So th they deprived millions of disabled people in the course of a couple sentences from the ability to do what the law clearly allowed them to do. So it's outrageous, but these people are legislating benefits on their own. These bureaucrats think it's in their power, and I wrote about it, and uh, it's, it's, 
you know, it really is outrageous that they did this. It's discriminatory. Uh, was that the uh, do-over? That was not the uh, the do-over. What, 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 what was the do-over? The do-over was that uh, before they changed the, uh, thanks to Janet Novak from Forbes, I learned about the ability to withdraw your retirement benefit uh, really at any time, and pay back what you'd received without any interest, and start from scratch. Uh, and I wrote about Janet wrote about it, I wrote about it, others wrote about it, and at some point, uh, Social Security changed the law and said that you can't do this beyond one year. You can withdraw your, uh, your filing for your retirement benefit, but you only have a year to do it. it used to be unlimited. So that got changed as well just by decree. somebody at Social Security, by decree. Uh, I think that had more sense. Uh, that wasn't really so much discriminating against people, but, but uh, this thing with disability I think is really uh, lousy. Deeming rules. What are, what are deeming rules? So one of the things we have in the book is uh, 20, uh, a list of 25 gotchas, the worst gotchas in Social Security. And deeming is probably the, one of the worst, maybe the worst. So here's the deal. Uh, Steve, you and I are, are both married. We're both 60. Uh, maybe you're 66. You filed for your retirement benefit. Or maybe you're 70 even. You filed for your retirement benefit. And so now I'm uh, in a position to file for my spousal benefit. So. Uh, because you're my spouse and I and all you have to do is have filed for your retirement benefit so if I file before full retirement age for my spousal benefit thinking I can wait to collect my own retirement benefit at 70 no because what happens is if I do it before full retirement age I'm going to be deemed to also be filing for my retirement benefit and then they're going to give me the larger of the two and that will most likely be my retirement benefit which means my spouse benefit which I filed for which I wanted to get is going to be wiped out forever and then I'm going to be left with a permanently reduced retirement benefit. So it's really a double whammy. That's deeming. If you try and take your spouse benefit early, you're forced to take your retirement benefit early. If you take your retirement benefit early, you're forced to take your spouse benefit early. That's one of the things we warn people to be careful about. Amazing. Yeah. So uh, things, things that this now crazy system encourages. Divorce. Divorce, yeah. If <laughs> it turns out that only one of two uh, spouses in a marriage can get a full spousal benefit. Again, if they play their cards right in terms of the timing and everything. Uh, but if you get divorced, both spouses can get a full spousal benefit. So if you got divorced two years before you reach full retirement age, uh, you could then live in sin and you both could collect a full, retirement, full spousal benefit for four years or so. Uh, and then at 70 get remarried. So that's an incentive to get divorced. And you know, in Paul's case, it would have been an extra $50,000, my co-author's case. Uh, now, you know, there's obviously other things going on, costs involving, uh, involved with divorce, but uh, uh, that's, that's there really. The, here's another example of uh, an incentive to uh, get divorced. If you are uh, if you had an ex who was a high earner and now you're remarried, but you remarried before age 60 and your ex who was a high earner passed away, uh, you uh, can't collect a divorcee widow's benefit because you got married, remarried before age 60. So here you are maybe age uh, 62, your ex has just passed away, you want to collect a large widow's benefit. What you can do is get divorced go in and collect that high widow's benefit, and then get remarried the next day to the same person. From good, what I understand, good, good, good business for Nevada. as far as I understand, this is not fraud, <laughs> this is legal. Uh, so, and I'm not advocating uh, that we maintain the system and that people, you know, obviously some of this is gaming the system, but the rules make no sense to begin with. And it's not clear what's fair and what's unfair. They're so complicated uh, set of rules. You've, we've been paying 12.4% of our paycheck every year from age 16 on. And we've been buying all these different types of benefits. And then, so why shouldn't we take advantage of what's uh, available, except that I don't think the system should be maintained this way. I, I have got a proposal for how to fix it at the purpleplans.org, which would freeze the existing system in place and put a modern social security system in place so that we're not stuck with this forever. Give us the story of the 
man with the four ex-wives? Well, so we set up a hypothetical uh, case in the book, a chapter uh, with William T. Gigolo, <laughs> and he spends his life just basically living off of women, and he specializes in marrying them for 10 years, and the next day after 10 years, he divorces them and goes on to the next wife. So that by the time he reaches retirement age, he can start collecting on one spouse after the next. Uh, as soon as that spouse reaches age 62, the, he can start collecting. So if he married a low earning spouse first and then a higher earning spouse second, he can collect on the first spouse to begin with at a, at early and then on the next spouse. And there's the reduction, the fact that he took it early, it doesn't matter. Uh, that was the first spouse. She's history. So Security thinks this is, uh, uh, so there's no, you know, it's like a, a fresh, uh, fresh benefit. So there's no reduction if the if he's, let's say, full retirement age when the next spouse uh, reaches f age 62. And then maybe the third spouse passes away, starts collecting on her. So we have him flipping from one benefit to the next over time until he's finally like at age 90 or so in a nursing home and he meets uh, this older lady who's got a very high earnings history and he can marry her and she's about to die. It only takes nine months to be married. Person dies, you can collect a widow's benefit on their record. Well, I can see a forensic files crime show on this, uh, <laughs> on this yeah. kind of thing. And uh, one of the, some of the crazy things is in terms of uh, what they deem as a credit, uh, working history, you point out that it's uh, $1,220. So if you got a fee for something for 5000 that's deemed a year's work? Yeah, you can, you can work uh, less than a, uh, four quarters and get four quarters of credit the way it's set up, depending on, uh, you know, if you know the rules and, and how you can press your earnings in a given quarter, yeah. And uh, have they dealt with gay marriage yet? Gay marriage, you can collect all the benefits of somebody who's uh, of, homos of heterosexual uh, marriage, married couples, the same benefits if you uh, are living in a state that recognizes uh, gay marriage. If you got married, for example, in Massachusetts, recognizes gay marriage, and then you moved to Texas, no, you don't get the benefits that uh, this, you can get your own retirement benefit, but you can't collect on your spouse. So that's, uh, I think, uh, grossly unfair. Uh, I think Social Security should be, uh, uh, should be fully uh, uh, independent of, should not uh, discriminate against uh, gay couples, period. But one of the dangers you pointed out earlier in this whole thing is that uh, they could render this whole book uh, null and void by changing all the rules overnight. They could if they... And, and, and no, yeah. nobody can stop them. Right. So I'm, <laughs> you know, I, in advocating that we adopt the Purple Social Security Plan, again, that's at the purpleplans.org for anybody who wants to look, uh, I'm advocating, you know, the end of my book, uh, the, the life of my book, because I think uh, this co-authored book would have a long lifespan if, if they don't change the rules or if they change the rules that they just modify the rules so we can, we can write new editions of this book all the time but I would prefer to see the system fixed because not only is it crazy complex but it's underfinanced by the tune to the tune of 33 percent this is this system is in worse uh, long-term financial shape than the Detroit pensions at the time Detroit went bankrupt they were about 20 percent underfinanced the trustees report that was released in July by the Social Security trustees, if you look at table 6F1, you'll see that it's 33% underfinanced. You have to read all the fine print and get it straight, but it's right there. Apparently the trustees themselves didn't read this table because they make no mention of it. Okay? These are all, you know, political appointees, and it's not just this, you know, the Democratic administration. We're talking about Republican administrations. They've been hiding the truth about Social Security for years. Uh, because they've been looking at these truncated projections. They assume uh, they only look out 75 years, which may seem fine, but your grandchildren are going to have paid a lot of taxes and expect benefits beyond that. So there's no reason, uh, uh, economic rationale, for, for looking uh, myopically at the system. You have to look at the whole future and all the taxes and all the, the, the outflow that has to be paid by those taxes, and the system's broke, and it's not broke. 20 years from now, or 10 years from now, or five years from now, it's broke today. So the accusation that by writing this uh, subversive book, you are uh, 
hastening the demise of the system. You're making the point uh, nobody knows what the system is anyway, and we, we better truly fix it. I think we need to fix it. Uh, my co-authors differ. They, we have a chapter at the <coughs> end of the book where we debate. Uh, they think the system's in better financial shape than I do. Uh, they're not worried about it. Uh, they're not economists. I, th I think economics is pretty clear about budgets. And we can't, our country can't afford, our kids cannot afford what we're doing to them. Call it fiscal child abuse. This is what I think we're actually engaged in a war on our children in a lot of dimensions. Uh, and it's, it's not just uh, fiscal, it's uh, uh, how we're dealing with the climate and how we're dealing with education and how we're dealing with uh, foreign wars. So I think we, we have to think very carefully about what we're doing with our children. 20% are in poverty as, I, as we speak. Chris Christie, <coughs> uh, his fix is a non-fix in your mind? So his fix is to uh, eliminate the benefits for people over earning over 200,000 200, income. Uh, Single 80,000. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, I think this is like coming out of the hip pocket. Uh, I don't think that's a comprehensive fix to the system. It's going to give people uh, worse work incentives, uh, people are going to have to pay 12.4% of their pay and realize they're not going to get anything back for it. I think it's just an example of piecemeal reform. Uh, we need to have uh, collective reform of, a, of our tax system, our social security system, our health care system, and our banking system. We need to have honest long-term fiscal accounting called the, uh, that uh, over 1,200 economists have endorsed. If you go to the informact.org, the inform, I-N-F-O-R-M, act, A-C-T, dot org, you'll see an endorsement by over 1,200 economists from every top department, including 12, 17 Nobel Prize winners, who are saying that the government is systematically lying about how its fiscal books. It's got most of its liabilities off the books, and we need to, need to well, do just, just Just one yeah. uh, yeah. little factoid. Yeah. Uh, the uh, Overall debt allegedly is about what 18 trillion. Held by the public is a little over 12 trillion, and uh, you make the point that the real debt is 241 trillion. 210 trillion. The fiscal trillion. gap that economists, uh, as a profession, really, because if you look at this, it's a who's who of economists from both sides of the political aisle. They're saying this is the way we should look at our liabilities. We shouldn't put certain things on the books and keep other things off the books by using fancy, fancy accounting, by using special words. You use the example of your uh, mother, the two checks she gets. Yeah. My mom is 95. I just spoke with her this morning. She's in great shape, uh, mentally alert, uh, and she just won a Grand Slam at a bridge game the other day. So she's collecting two checks in the mail. Uh, they look the same. Uh, one's for Social Security and one's for interest in a, a principal on a, on a treasury bill. The present value of those interest and principal payments is on the books. The present value of her social security checks is not on the books. That was just a matter of a language choice. When they took money from my mom to buy uh, uh, and gave her back the treasury bill, they said they were borrowing from her. And then they Pay, call the payments in the future return of principal plus interest. When they took money from my mom uh, for Social Security, they called it taxation. And the benefits in the future, the payment in the future, they called a transfer payment. So it became call, it was be called uh, taxes and transfer payments rather than borrowing and repayment. That is a matter of language. It has no, no economic basis. So the 13 trillion in official debt in the hands of the public is a meaningless number. The true fiscal picture is that we have expenditures that have a present value uh, uh, that's huge, and we subtract the present value of the taxes, and the net difference is called the fiscal gap. That's $210 trillion. That's uh, a description of bankruptcy. The country is 58% under finance in the sense that we need to, to come up with $210 trillion in present value. We need to raise every single federal tax immediately and permanently by 58%. Of course, that would wreck the economy. That would wreck the economy. So we need to fix things in a way that, uh, uh, that, <laughs> that works. And we can't have Chris Christie coming up with, you know, uh, oh, let's do this uh, out of the blue. We right. need economists. You know, I think that we wouldn't have engineers build a bridge over the Hudson 
Uh, we wouldn't, sorry, we wouldn't have politicians build their own bridge over the Hudson. We'd actually hire engineers. And I think here we need to have economists, not politicians, redesign these systems. You have Democrats saying they're going to raise benefits. I know, uh, <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> Senator Sanders is, uh, is running for uh, president now, wants to increase Social Security benefits. We need to worry about uh, inequality and, and uh, we have a lot of poor older people, so I understand uh, where he's coming from. But we need to understand the, the hole we're in to begin with, and we, we need to under get a handle on that and look systematically at how all the different fiscal programs we've got are interacting. Uh, so I'm doing some research on that with an economist at Berkeley named Alan Auerbach. We'll have a study out very shortly. But uh, you know, if you look at it, there's 25 different major fiscal programs that have their own tax systems and their own redistribution. Uh, so let's see what the overall picture is and also what the incentives to work and save are and then come up with some solutions before we start piecemeal doing this or that. One other topic we just touched briefly on since it hits investors is the Securities Investor Protection Corp, CIPIC, right. which uh, we're told means a broker, your account is insured for at least $500,000. Right. Uh, you say ain't so. I think this is one of the biggest frauds that uh, Wall Street is uh, committing. Uh, they have this institution called uh, CIPIC, that's, and you have this sense if you open up a brokerage account that you're insured up to uh, $500,000 if it's uh, stolen. But if you look at the victims of the two largest Ponzi schemes in history, the Stanford Ponzi scheme and the Madoff Ponzi scheme, None of the Stanford victims were, have been compensated even a penny, and a large fraction of the Madoff victims have received nothing. And indeed, they're going after many of the Madoff victims to take money back. And so the, the problem, what they're doing is, they're saying that if you put money in, uh, and you took out more than you put in, then you are a winner, and therefore you're not insured under CIPIC, and, there, and therefore whatever money you had left, you've lost, and also we're not gonna pay you the $500,000. Now just think about it, Steve. Suppose you put in some money when you were 30, maybe you put in $200,000 into an, an account with some broker or some firm, and it grows, you're told, at the rate of, you know, it's in the stock market and over time it compounds, and you have to take out money every uh, year to pay the taxes, okay? So by the, and then, uh, you know, comes to uh, uh, some point where you have, uh, uh, take out a big chunk of money for uh, maybe to treat your your wife for ca her cancer or to make a charitable contribution, whatever. So, and then two years later, fraud is discovered. Well, you're going to be viewed as a net winner because you took out more money than you put in. But you had nothing to do with the fraud. Yeah, nothing to do with the fraud. So you're now <coughs> viewed as a criminal and you're treated as such. And uh, let's say you had three million in the account, you took out a million to give to charity, they're going to come not only not give you, you've, you've lost two million, they're not going to give you the 500,000 to insure against the two million dollar loss, they're going to actually sue you for the, the, difference, the difference between the million and the 200,000 you put in originally, which is 800,000. This is incredibly risky. No, no one should keep their brokerage account at this point. It's too dangerous. I, I wrote a, a column for Forbes called Close Your Brokerage Account. It got enormous uh, 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 you know, analysis by people. A lot of people looked at it, and then the head of CIPIC wrote a response, which uh, I responded to in turn. And I think people can go to my website, uh, Forbes, and, and look at this debate, and they'll, I think they'll come away agreeing with me. It's straightforward. This is just uh, fraud. They're, they're advertising insurance, and they're not providing it. The Legislation, legislative remedy is a bill called the Restoring Mainstream Investor Protection, Main, excuse me, Restoring Main Street Investor Protection and Confidence Act, uh, the Garrett Maloney bill. Right. So uh, you would uh, hope I'm, that I'm, Congress will pass, finally pass that. Bipartisan, Garrett's a Republican, Maloney's a Democrat. Yeah, I think until that bill is passed and needs to be passed immediately, everybody who's got a brokerage account should close it down because it's not safe. If, if you take your money out uh, and spend it, you can't sleep at night for two years because there's a, a if you a clawback. So you can be sued uh, <clears throat> depending on your situation and for that money that you withdrew, even though it was, you know, you th 
your own broker might not be involved. It might be some other broker down the hall that was engaged in the, in the fraud in that particular account. And so you're getting hit by a double fraud. Not only are you defrauded by the broker's account, uh, the broker, but also by SIPC. So two disturbing things. One, Social Security, as bad as the tax code. And the other is uh, SIPC ain't what it's supposed to be. No, yes. And both need to be fixed and fixed immediately. Well, thank you. Let's hope something gets done. Positive. <laughs> My pleasure.